All right. So <clears throat> what we're going to do tonight, <clears throat> the goals for today, understand the performance test process, you know, the step-by-step -step, uh, method I have for writing the performance test and completing it successfully, getting a passing score. You know, how do you get a passing score on the performance test? And when I teach, you know, I don't just want to give you some perfect model answer. That's not the goal because then you have to self-assess and you don't know, okay, well, really where would I have fallen? What I want to do is teach everybody, you know, how do you write a performance test so that you get, you know, what does it take to get a 55? And then how do you bring a 55 to a 60 and a 60 to a 65? That varies, you know, among the essays that varies, uh, you know, in the different subjects, it varies, um, you know, on the PT. I mean, it doesn't vary in terms of like the rubric and what is necessary, but, you know, each one is a little bit different. So it's, it's helpful. I really want to walk you through step by step and show you a large variety of, um, of tasks and um, just some kind of important things with respect to the performance test tonight. So we are first going to talk about the process. We're going to talk about how, and when I say how the performance test is written, what I'm referring to here is, you know, how the bar examiners, when they are putting it together, what are they thinking about? Why are they doing certain things? When you understand how it's put together, you can then learn how to pull it apart. And so that's one of the things that I want to talk about. And I go in depth in this stuff in my Mastering the PT course, which starts next Thursday on the 8th. And then also, how do you uh, understand how, and I have a little typo, how to organize a PT. They can submit us to this earlier. All right, so this is the performance test process. I think I have each of these, okay. So I'm going to overview, I'm going to give you a brief overview of this, and then um, I'll talk about each of these a little bit more in depth as well. So the very first document that you have, um, the very first document that you have within a performance task is what we call the task memo. That is where you are given your task. Most of you, I think, know this. Um, you want to review the task memo and you want to identify what's the tone, is it objective or persuasive, Who, who is the audience, who are you writing to, so you can understand, you know, is, are you speaking with somebody um, that's a bit more sophisticated, like another lawyer that understands certain things, or you speak certain things? Are you speaking with a client who's less sophisticated um, and doesn't understand, um, you know, legal stuff? So you have to really write a little bit more simply. Um, are you writing to the court, which requires a bit more formality, et cetera? And then what are you preparing? What's the product? What's the product? So are you writing a memo? Are you writing a brief? Are you writing a letter to a client, a letter to opposing counsel? All four of those are the really four of the most common tasks that are assigned. The fifth most common, which is not that often, I would say is a, um, is a closing argument. They just gave one of those in the last couple of years. Um, and even that, it's not really that different. So review the task memo, identify uh, the tone, which means is it objective is, or is it persuasive? Identify the audience, who are you writing to? What's the product? What are you preparing? Also make note of any organizing principles. So how will you organize the bulk of your PT, the analysis section or the argument section? How will you do that? And then are there any special instructions? Like if they tell you to write a statement of facts or if they tell you, um, you know, to include a short, uh, brief answer, a short answer at the beginning of each section to each of the questions. So there are sometimes things like that that they will ask you to do. So are there any special instructions? Next, I want you to set up the PT skeletal outline so that after you read the task memo, if I know I'm writing a memo, I'm going to go do my memo setup. If I know I'm writing a letter to opposing counsel, I'm going to do that setup to make it look like the letter. The, and at this point, I'm going to add also a really quick intro, a really quick conclusion. Just one little note on that, you know, it doesn't necessarily, some things I want to talk about, I want to talk about, um, but, and I go into this in a lot of depth, um, I go into this in a lot of depth in the actual course, but one thing is, is if you are someone that knows that you do not finish performance tests, there are certain things from this that you will have to cut. So like one of those things could be like, you know, not doing the intro and conclusion, like maybe you don't do that and, you know, or you do it just like really briefly um, or, you, you know, I have seen people that like don't do it at all and can get a passing answer. Like those things don't get you a lot of points. I think there's benefits doing them. We do tend to see them quite a lot in selected answers. We see them in high scoring performance tests, et cetera. So they are really good to, they are good to include, but that's not where you're getting your points. 
Um, the other, the next thing is you want to add in, if you know the issues that you're addressing and how you're going to organize your analysis or arguments section, if you know that, then you go ahead and you put in your headings, you put in your headings. And if you don't have your organizing principles, but you know that you are going to get them from some document in the file, so from a letter or a motion, something like that, you want to go and actually read that next. So set it up. Um, and maybe quickly go look at that document so that you can get your headings. They might say something in the task memo like, um, they might say something like, uh, you know, please respond to clients' questions that are that are summarized at the end of my interview with the client. So I'm gonna quickly go look at that. They've done that. They also might say, please respond to each claim from the complaint, then go look at that. That's how you're gonna organize. After you do that, you do a quick skim of the file. We'll walk through this. You're just trying to get like a sense for the what what we have and how big the file is. Um, and that's it. You make a couple of quick notes as you're going through it. You spend about five minutes doing that. And oftentimes for me personally, I can get through these steps one through one through three really quickly, especially if you get used to doing this stuff, you get used to following these steps. You can do this incredibly, incredibly quickly. Um, all right, and also like I give you in the course, I give you templates for memos, for um, for briefs. I give you a template for, I do have a template for a closing argument, I give them for letter to a client, letter to a closing counsel. So all of that stuff you should have down cold. <clears throat> very, very quickly be able to do that stuff. Um, step four, so after, after you skim the file, and that is something again that if you are someone that knows you often run out of time, or maybe you get stuck on skimming the file and you start just reading it, I don't want you to do that, so that you might skip step three. And I go into all of that um, a bit more in depth as well. Step four, this is your really first, well, second major, major thing you have to do. You need to do steps one through three. I think two is a really big part of it, one and two. Three, maybe, maybe not for you. Um, but the next big thing is to skim and read the library. And when I say skim, you know, it's a little bit, um, um, when I say skim, I'll show you what that means. But you're just really trying to get a sense of, uh, you're trying to identify what did they give you everything in the library for? Like, why did they give this to you? And you're trying to find the really important stuff. You're trying to figure out, um, you know, you're trying to find where are the rules that govern and where is the analysis that the court did? You want to identify those two things. And I'm going to show you how to do that. You really want to focus in on the analysis of each case. And oftentimes, and, and like you always start with, you know, skipping over the facts of the case. You always, always like 99% of the time, I never read the facts of the case because um, it just, you don't need to because the really important facts are within the analysis. Sometimes I'll go back and read them, um, you know, but it's very, very rare. Um, and like, and, and what I'm talking about right now is like, what do you need to do to just get a passing score, right? To just get that 65. If I want to go, you know, if I have time and I'm like, all right, I can really push this. I might go back and read the facts from, and this is from the cases in the library. I might go back and read those and add more depth and like add more facts so that I can like analogize, not like, and I probably wouldn't add it into my actual performance test. But I would read it so I, and then use those to compare the facts of my case even more. I want to deepen my analysis. So you want to, but I want you in this step four and I want everybody, you know, when you're first doing this, I want everybody, my goal is for you guys first to be able to get, you know, a 55 and then a 60 and then a 65 and then go higher than that and then go higher than that. So it's this very incremental process that I want, um, that I want people to engage in. I know there's a hand up, but I actually can't. For some reason, it's if I if I call on you, then um, then it actually lets you control my screen. But can you just type me a message? All right. Um, so read each case with a purpose, and the purpose is why did they give me this case? You have to know that the bar graders gave you the cases for a very particular reason, and that's what they want you to use it for. Um, so you're, you're always trying to figure out what did they give me this for and how am I supposed to use it? You want to know what issue does this go towards and am I analogizing to this case or am I distinguishing from this case? Am I, am I, is it similar to the facts of my case? Does it have the same conclusion that I want or does it come to the opposite conclusion from what I want, which is then you would distinguish from it. And um, so is it the opposite conclusion and um, are the facts similar to mine? If they're not, if they're the complete opposite, you're probably going to distinguish from it. 
assign the cases to their appropriate issues. You make a note of this in your actual document in or in your if you're handwriting it. It's different, slightly different. You would write make a note in your blue book. Um, but if you're typing, and I'm assuming most of you are, um, then um, then you just make a quick note. This case is going to this issue. After you skim and you read the library, so you're skimming it. When I say skim, you're skimming over the facts. Once you start to see like what happened, the procedural posture, then I usually slow down there, and because I know the rules are coming next, so I'm going to identify and I actually label and I'll do it in this. Um, I'll do it here. Uh, label the rules, label the analysis, and then I'm and then after that, step five, and you are actually writing here. You do do some writing in um, steps two and step five, you actually do some writing. Because a lot of, I know a lot of bar companies, they just say you spend, you know, the first half reading everything and the second half you spend writing. And sort of true. But here, you know, I wanna say like, you're doing the, you're writing the analysis in the second half. That is absolutely true. But in the first half, you are doing um, a quite a bit of writing as well. All right. So then you draft your rules and your rule proofs. I do give you this little formula for drafting your rule proofs. So I say, you know, in what's the case name, the court held, what's the holding, because, and include your facts and reasoning. I mentioned what happens in the cases, but I do it, you know, I'm not going to go super crazy in depth. Um, I want to include the relevant information that I need. What did the court hold regarding the issue? And why? Because that's really what's significant. These are the most critical things that you can get from the library, the holding, the facts, and the reasoning for each case. So I'm going to draft my rules and my rule proofs. You always, we could also call this a case explanation. I use those terms interchangeably. Um, but it's, I think a rule proof is, is what that means. It's proving up how the rule works in operation. So how does the rule that's given above, uh, how, how did another court take that rule and apply it to the facts? So that we can then say, okay, you know, we're going to do exactly what that court did, or based on what this other court said in interpreting it, this is the likely outcome in our case, or this is what it ought to be. After that, you spend about 15 minutes reading the file. Um, and then after that, you write your analysis. So you're making comparisons between the facts from the case of the library and our facts. And you're also just applying the law to the facts. This is one big thing that I saw missing in the July 2022 PT answers from a lot of people is people didn't analyze the entire rule. It was defamation and people didn't, um, people didn't actually analyze each step of defamation, each element rather. So, and then if you have time at the end, you proofread. And I would say generally people don't have five minutes at the end. Um, so this, this is like an ideal scenario, all of this. Um, but if you have like one minute at the end, I would check your headings. And make sure that those are correct and that you didn't leave anything like big and glaring um, as a mistake. So that this is our uh, process. This is the steps, the eight steps to writing a good uh, passing performance test. It obviously goes a lot deeper than this. But um, and one thing I will say, if you're following this and you find that you're still not finishing, it's really, really a good idea to um, to keep track. Like keep a little, like you can keep your phone and you know the timer that's on it, and you can keep track. Okay, how long did step one take me? How long did step two? Like you could just write like one through eight on a notepad next to you, and each time you finish one of the steps, write the time down and see how long each step took you. Because then if you are running out of time, you can say, okay, this is where I'm losing it, and then there are solutions. Like when people are in my classes and they're practicing, I'm constantly bringing up okay, and and people ask me those questions, and I will talk about particular PTs. And if you constantly run out of time when you are trying to draft your rules or when you're explaining the case, doing your rule proofs, or if you're caught up on step three, or if you get caught on step four, like where I have to know that in order to help you and to guide you and to come up with a solution for that particular problem. Um, so it's really important. So these, I put these timings here. I do think they are very important. Oh, oops, that one. Okay. So um, now we are going to actually look at the performance test. So let me share screen. So we're just really focused on this. And this is the document that's the task. Actually, I'm going to take one step back. I want to just point one thing out. 
the PT instructions changed in February 2022 for the February 2022 exam. Instruction four is different. So if you have not read these instructions, you should go through and read them to, you know, tonight, uh, you know, this week, sometime before you take the exam to be familiar with them. The most important thing that I want to mention right now is that is number four changed. So I want to read it to you and talk about that. It says the file consists of source documents containing all the facts of the case. The first document in the file is a memorandum containing the directions for the task you are to complete. The other documents in the file contain information about your case, and this is what's new, and may include some facts that are not relevant. Oh, that's not what's new. That's always been new. Some facts that are not relevant. This is what's new. Facts are sometimes ambiguous, incomplete, or even conflicting. As in practice, a client's or supervising attorney's version of events may be incomplete or unreliable. Applicants are expected to recognize when facts are inconsistent or missing and are expected to identify sources of additional facts. So recognize when facts are inconsistent or missing and identify additional sources. So that is new. So you should always expect to have a little instruction or a little section at the end of your PT before your conclusion addressing, you know, additional information needed, something like that. That's something that I did not see that I had not seen a lot of people do. And even that got passing scores. It wasn't as obvious as it was for this exam, but it was very obvious for the February 2022 exam. There was a big discrepancy within that one. So there was inconsistent. On this one, I think there was some additional information that would have been helpful. Um, so we'll talk about that when we get into it. Okay, and you should read the rest of the, um, you should read the rest of the instructions as well. So I look for these five things, tone, audience, product, organizing principles, special instructions. And I wanna make note of these things. Um, I want to make note of these things in my task memo. So it says here, now I want to read it. And I would have my highlighter and my pen, etc. So Grace Gosling is the web is the web host of www.cravencableconsumersunited.com or CCC, a consumer website that contains a blog established to provide a platform for dissatisfied cable customers in Craven, Columbia. So Gosling has retained our firm for advice concerning a complaint for defamation filed against her and Hank Hardy. So Grace Gosling is our client. I always like to make note of who our client is. So complaint for defamation. This is the complaint against her and Hank Hardy, a subscriber and poster to her blog by Jack Nisi. He's the plaintiff. And I like to make notes here. So here. Plaintiff. Grace is the defendant that's the suit defendant client my dog is barking he doesn't like that our client is being all right um all right Nisi claims that both Gosling and Hardy are liable as a result of statements Hardy posted about him to Gosling's blog all right, so I am preparing. I love when task memos are like this uh, because they give you the issues and it makes it so nice and straightforward. So it says here, I am preparing to meet with Gosling about Nisi's complaint. To help me prepare for the meeting, please draft an objective memorandum that discusses. I love this because it gives me a ton of good information that discusses one, whether Nisi would prove that Hardy's statements as quoted in the complaint. So quoted in the complaint and note that these are statements. There are two, there are two, which tells me I want to separate these out probably. Were defamatory if you were to prove the facts alleged and two, whether Gosling is immune from liability for Hardy's allegedly defamatory statements. So I have two issues. Do not draft a separate statement of facts, but use the facts in your discussion. So now let me say, there we go. So. I want to make note here. What's the tone? Just one second while my tone is objective, right? My audience, my audience, I'm writing to my boss, Carmen Cardinal. There's so, so many C's here. Craven Columbia, Carmen Cardinal, Craven Cable Consumers. Product is a memo. 
organizing principle, these are the issues. And special instructions, no statement of facts. All right, so I know all of this information. I've got all of this here. All right, so then step two is to set up my skeletal outline. This is a memo, so I do my two from date ray. It's objective, so I have my major, major headings here, introduction, I have my analysis heading, and I have my conclusion heading. So you basically, and I put a little note here, this is the basic structure for all performance tests. So you always have an intro analysis or argument heading and conclusion. And I made some notes here about what you want to include. So you guys can look at that afterwards. So I, but I make it look like a memo and I just have one sentence that says below, please find my analysis regarding one and two. And I just pulled that from the task memo, even though the formatting is a little funny. Oops. Oops. Um, okay. So I put those in here. So whether it needs to be proof party statements as quoted in the complaint uh, or defamatory, if you were to prove the facts alleged and B, whether Gossing is immune from liability for Hardy's allegedly defamatory statements. So I looked at these. One thing to note here, it says in here, the statements as quoted in the complaint. So I just wanna, I don't know how many there are. So I wanna just go look at that really quickly and then I'll come back. So, you know, I'm like skipping, skimming. I don't see statements yet, but if we go down here, we see these, there's two statements, A and B. So I, I might at this point, put in headings here, statement one, statement two. I'm gonna, because I wanna address these separately because there are two and I wanna make sure, I wanna make sure that I address both of them, right? So like one thing that everybody should know, and I, like, I'm guilty of this too, is we, we so often think that we are going to remember things that we don't. So it's, it's easy to be like, yeah, I'll remember that. But then you come down to it and you start writing and you get in the groove of things and you don't separate these things out. And maybe then you forget to analyze something that you meant to analyze. Um, it's really, really common. That's why like in MBEs, it's important to take notes. And, you know, when you're doing the essays, it's important to like walk through so many of these things because we forget and you're in the, under the stress of the exam it makes things difficult. So I put my headings in here. I'm like, okay, there are two statements. I like to analyze things separately because each one is a separate defamation potentially. So I'd want to pay attention to that. All right. So I have that. Next thing I'm going to do. So this, this my, my step two is done. So the next thing I want to do is I want to skim through the file. And when I am skimming, I'm just trying to see what I have here. And I'm when I'm skimming, I'm just looking at things that jump off the page to me. So anything that's like big and bold and in quotes, like, you know, symbols, and you know, stuff like that, that it looks like they're trying to get my attention. This doesn't look that significant, but I always do like to say um, what this is. And the reason I make a note in the top right corner is because I usually, when I'm um, like what I teach, and you can bring these in in California, you use those little plastic paper clips, they're called plastic clips. And you can bring those in. You can't bring in metal paper clips, but you can bring in plastic ones. And I put one of those on each page of a new document just to kind of stay organized. And that way, when I'm like flipping to find something, I can find things really easily. And I just look at the top right corner. Not a big deal, but it's something that like I found helpful. And when I was practicing, I did that a lot. Um, so I like to do that. So this is just a blog excerpt. Nothing really jumps out off the page, but says here, oppose rate increase. So we want to oppose the rate increase. So I do see that, I make note of that. There's some dates here, and then I see the comments. Um, uh, oh, and then I see here, here's the comment from Hank Hardy. There's one, and then there's another one. A um, Couple of comments. I don't want to dig into this stuff quite yet um, because I'm going to get into that. I don't really understand the significance of all the facts. Yes, I'm familiar with defamation, obviously, as are all of you. Um, but I don't know like what I really need to focus on just yet. So skim through the file. So I, I have those, the blog excerpt goes on to the next page. And then I have here, I have the complaint. And I'm not going to read this yet. I'm just kind of skimming to say, what do I have? And I think I really got the significant stuff, probably. Um, but I'm just going to look when I skim, I might be, you know, I'm generally just reading the first line, not the first sentence, but the first line of each paragraph. 
This is plaintiff Jack Nisi is a private individual. Nisi has worked as an independent television producer for 20 years. Defendant Grace Galsing is an individual and is now at an all time. So this is just giving some of the background information. Defendant Hank Hardy is an individual and is now okay. He's a defendant. And then we have, um, uh, then we have here the two statements. Okay. And then we have here facts. This is what a lot of people didn't use. The statements referred to Nisi by name and address. So that's telling us this is getting into the other elements of defamation. The statements quoted in paragraph five are false as they pertain to Nisi, among other things. So he's stating that they are false. They refer to him. So it's a statement about him. Um, the statements quoted in paragraph five were seen and read by Nisi's neighbors. This is a publication to a third party. And then injury, causation and injury. So as a proximate result. So we have here all of these other facts that relate to the other elements or well we have paragraph seven which deals with falsity which I i'm assuming that most of you here took the, the july exam um and the big issue with uh the first the big issue for issue a here is were the statements false right he and there's a question is well are they actually false statements or are they opinion so that was one of the big issues and you can see here that there is an emphasis on the falsity component because look at how, how big paragraph seven is as opposed to paragraph eight or anything else. Also, the library is dedicated largely um, to that issue. Um, well, half of it. So then we have the rest of these, so that's just a complaint and that's it. So that is it. So the next thing we are going to do, we are going to skim and read the library. And when I do this, I make a little note next to every paragraph with what it's about. Each paragraph, serves one purpose, basically. So I want to pay close attention to that. And I'm gonna skim until I note it, notice where I really need to read. Um, and I'm not gonna be doing any writing in my actual document. And, and for you all, this would be your actual answer in Examplify, Examsoft Examplify. All right. I always, again, write the name of the case in the top right corner. I might make a couple of notes here about what I want to use the case for when I'm done. All right. So this case arises, and so I'm going to skim, right? So I'm going to read the first line of each paragraph. This one happens just to be one complete sentence, but it often isn't. You, you keep going if you know that it's like this is just facts. And then once I start getting to the procedure, I know they're going to then give me the rules and the analysis, and that's really where I want to slow down. That's really where I want to slow down. Um, all right, this says, this case arises from an aborted sale of a wig by Wilma Walsh to Ann Anderson. I'm like, all right, from an aborted sale of a wig. So this is facts, I label it. Okay, thereafter, Walsh authored a lengthy statement about the sale on an online consumer blog. Rip off report, okay. The one thing I will say is that when I'm skimming, if I think if I see things that are in quotes, I often want to pay, um, pay attention to that. So it says preface by the words facts for two alleged allegedly and like allegedly defamatory statements. So this has the word this has this highlighted. So I do want to pay attention to that. And there's two statements. So Ann Anderson, who works for the Astoria Building Department, wrote an unauthorized check for a wig from her boyfriend's account, and at the bottom wrote that it was for a prosthetic donation. So this looks, you know, when I'm thinking, okay, defamation, this is pretty serious. This is dated, like, really written as though it's true. Factual statements. And then two, Ann Anderson brought to court a made-up document from FedEx stating that Walsh had opened the package, saw what was in it, and gave it back to FedEx. Okay, so these are facts. And then I do see this here in quotes. Thank you, Ann Anderson. Um, so this is an anonymous author posted the following to the consumer website, Yelp.com. Thank you, Ann Anderson of the Astoria Building Department for hurting the community by giving all the construction businesses in Astoria to family and friends in exchange for bribes. So that's an accusation and like a pretty specific accusation of a specific offense. It says, I hope that an investigation takes place soon and that you end up in prison. Okay, so this, I do read this. I often skip the facts, but there is stuff in quotes. And that to me tells me that it's usually something like that is a sign that the bar graders like really want us to read that. So I do pay more attention to that. So there's facts, but I do, um, there are things in quotes and they're numbered. So I think that's significant. And then that's 
Okay. Upon reading these statements, Anderson was devastated. Okay. That's in Colombia. Now I'm getting to rule. Defamation consists of right. So now I'm getting to rule, and I highlight my rules. I usually highlight them in different colors when I'm doing this on the screen, but for some reason I can't. I don't think. Um, let's see. Um, but I'll try to modify it. So in Colombia, defamation consists of the publication of a false statement to a third party, which proximately results in injury to another. So that's, uh, let's see. Yeah, I can't. It won't let me change the color right now, and I won't deal with it. So I want to pay attention to my rules and think about, okay, what am I going to use this case for? This already sounds to me like I'm using it for this first issue. To be false, a statement must be one of fact and cannot be one solely of opinion. Highlight that. I also always like to um, put a space in between everything I highlight. So I'm like, this is one rule. Then the next rule is one of the things and I talk about this a lot in the PT course and we do practice writing rules. Um, but you, one of the things that where a lot of people lose time is in getting all the rules down. So I do go in and show you, okay, like how do you figure out when to omit a certain rule, et cetera. So to be false, a statement must be one of fact and cannot be one solely of opinion. That's another rule. If a statement is reasonably susceptible to an interpretation as either fact or opinion, its proper characterization is determined by asking whether, under the totality of the circumstances, a reasonable trier of fact would conclude that the statement communicates actual fact rather than expresses mere opinion. So I want to point a couple of things out here. So this is obviously a rule. But there's a couple of things we have to show. We have to say if a statement is reasonably susceptible to an interpretation as either fact or opinion. Step that's step one. Um, then it's then if that's true, its proper its proper characterization is determined by asking whether, under the totality of the circumstances, a reasonable trier of fact would conclude that the statement communicates actual fact rather than expresses mere opinion. So there's sort of two steps. There's, this is a two-step analysis. So first, we want to determine, you know, is it reasonably susceptible to an interpretation as either fact or opinion? And two, under the totality of the circumstances, would a reasonable trier of fact conclude that the statement communicates actual fact rather than expression, expressing mere opinion? So it's a two-step analysis there. So it's, I'm reading this. I'm like, okay, so this is what I need to show. But I also need to show the other elements of defamation. All right, and then it's getting into, so this is all rule, and then we get into analysis. Because now it's going from this broad, in Columbia, defamation consists of, and it's giving me these rules here. And then this is now talking about the parties in our case. So that is the analysis of the case. And I label these paragraphs because I'm gonna go through the whole library, and then I'm gonna come back through Knowing what I use the case for, and I'm going to type in my rules, I'm going to copy the rules, and I'm going to draft my rule proof. But Walsh claims that her statements concerning Anderson were not defamatory because they were not factual. Relying on her recent decision in Inski v. Ilston, she argues that even if they were reasonably susceptible to an interpretation as either fact or opinion, a reasonable trier of fact would conclude that they expressed a mere opinion rather than communicated an actual fact under the totality of the circumstances including that they appeared on consumer websites where most readers expect to see opinions rather than facts. So this is, this is the defendant's argument here. And whenever we see the defendant's argument, I'm not, I, I do want to read that and pay attention to it, but I want to know, well, what did the court say? Um, you know, on a consumer website, ours is a consumer website. Most people expect to see opinions rather than facts. So that's something to, to think about. And anytime I see an opposing you know, a defendant's argument here, I want to think about that because I'm the defendant here. What argument might they make? That's something that I can use. So the bar graders give you stuff like this to sort of like throw you a bone. Um, okay, so we have those arguments. And it says in Inski, they also give us a case within a case. So I, this, and whenever they do this, we often want to use them. They're giving us another case to use. And if they give us two cases on one issue, that usually means you know, and here we have two statements. That's probably means one's going to go one way, the other's going to go the other way, or they're going to be in between somewhere. So this gives us a bit of ambiguity. And it also tells me, okay, you know, issue one is big, right? I always am, I always am trying to figure out how much time do I need to allocate among the issues to have enough time 
to address everything in depth, but this looks like there's a lot going on here. So in Inski, we stated, internet forums promote a looser communication style and an outlet for the user to criticize others. Users are able to engage freely in informal debate and criticism, leading many to substitute gossip for accurate reporting and adopt a provocative tone. There, we held that, under the totality of the circumstances, a reasonable trier fact would conclude that a statement posted online calling company executives liars, losers, and crooks expressed mere opinion rather than communicated actual fact. So here is, so we have Inski, and I'm going to make a note here. Inski rule. And then analysis of Inski. The, and the holding of Inski. So we have the holding and, and the reasoning. So I would say, you know, in Inski, the court held that, uh, the, the statement, a statement amounted to opinion rather than fact, and therefore was not defamatory because, so why? We explained that while unquestionably offensive and demeaning to the executives, the statement was more emotional catharsis than information. All right. Here, however, things are different. So then here's more analysis. And here they distinguish from Inski. So here, in this case, they do say that it is defamatory. So I want to know why. Here, however, things are different. Walsh's statements on ripoffreport.com, which were labeled facts. So they say that they're labeled facts, recited alleged facts detailing perjury and fraud by Anderson. Walsh's statement on Yelp.com similarly recited alleged facts um, detailing Anderson's awarding of city contracts to friends and family in exchange for bribes. We do not believe that these statements were reasonably susceptible to an interpretation as mere opinion. But even if they were, we conclude that under the totality of the circumstances, a reasonable trier of fact would conclude that they communicated actual fact. So I'm going to make a note here. I know that in every analysis issue, I have a, I have a paragraph of rules, paragraph of a rule proof. Not every single one has a rule proof, but generally. Um, so my rules, my proof. And then I have analysis. Uh, you don't always have counter argument, but you often do, and a conclusion. So it's always, you know, it's three to five paragraphs. Um, and in the course, I go into a lot of these as well, but you all should know, you know, your rules, or what is a rule proof, a rule proof, you might have in your legal writing course um, in law school, you probably went into this where you explain what happened in a case with respect to the issue in this heading. So I'm going to walk through doing a little bit of that. And then here, because I have two statements, I want to analyze each statement separately. So I have, and I, I put these notes here, and I actually do write these in, and then I delete them. Um, so this, I want to make a note about my analysis. If as I'm reading this, I think of the counter argument, I want to make a note of that. So this A here is for analysis. And I want to make, usually the thing that I'm looking for here is, am I analogizing to this, this case that I'm, uh, that I'm, explaining here or am I distinguishing from it here if I have an idea of what the counter argument is I'm going to put it there and then I have a conclusion all right and I'm going to do this for so I'll start filling this in so I think for this is this case I'm using this Anderson rules the rules come from Anderson and I'm going to explain do a rule proof for Anderson and Inski and I think here, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I don't, I actually don't know what I'm going to do yet. Because I don't know what my points are for mine. But now I'm starting to put this together and I'm going to make some notes here. Let me just pause to check to see if there was any questions. All right, so I'm going to keep going. Let's go on to the next case. We have here, Columbia Fa uh, Valley Fair Housing, Council of Roommate.com. One thing, just really briefly, kind of a silly thing. You have these long cases. I generally will take the first name and use that to cite to. You do not need to do any sort of proper citing. You just need to do a short cite to the case. Um, if it's a case like this where the first name is really long, I'm just going to use a second case. So I'm just, this one for me is just going to be called Roommate. Okay. 
DefendantRoommate.com operates a website designed to, this is just facts. The Columbia Valley Fair Housing Council sued roommate. So I notice here, um, this is like a fair housing council suing, um, suing. And whenever I see that, I think of like discrimination. So, all right. Um, and then I see here, the legislative the legislature enacted section 230 to protect websites. So here I'm getting into rule. And this is again where I'm going to start reading. So the legislature enacted section 230 to protect websites from liability for including or failing to remove actionable content in order to preserve the free flowing nature of internet speech and commerce without unduly prejudicing the enforcement of other important laws. So that's policy. Um, that's something to be aware of. Um, policy is not necessarily a rule. Policy tells us why we have a rule. It says rule, but that's okay. You don't care, right? You guys know I meant rules. But here I want to make a note that this is policy. To that section, to that end, Section 230 immunizes internet computer service providers from liability arising from content created by third parties. But it does not immunize information content providers from liability. Nor does it immunize interactive computer service providers from liability to the extent that they act as information content providers. So we have a lot of rule here. And one thing that's really important, and I go into this, we don't have time to go into it tonight, but I go into it in the course. It's one of those like deeper things that we spend time doing. Um, is there's a ton of rule in here. And oftentimes, if you have trouble finishing PTs, and partly if it's if you get stuck at the step where you are writing your rules and your rule proofs, for a lot of people, it's like there's just too much rule and they can't get it all down. So it's a skill and it has to be practiced of editing down your rules for concision, really thinking about what you need to have. Oftentimes, if I'm doing it and it's because I practice this, um, I can take all these rules and sort of put them together into one sentence and make it a lot shorter. Um, but for the most part, I just want you to copy the rules over that are all the rules that are necessary. So let's keep going. An interactive computer service provider is a person or entity that enables computer access by multiple users to a computer server. An information content provider is a person or entity that is responsible in whole or in part for the creation or development of content. Thus, an interactive computer service provider passively displays content that may be actively created or developed by an information content provider. Whereas an information content provider actively creates or develops content that may be passively displayed by an interactive computer service provider. Okay, so like a lot, a lot of rule here. Against this background, we examine whether roommate is entitled to immunity under Section 230 for three specific functions the council alleges violate housing discrimination law. So here, I want to note one major difference. Here, and I was thinking discrimination above, and now we see this here. This is housing discrimination. We know that like there are things that even private people can't do um, in housing, making a housing decision that you can't discriminate. So um, so here it's which is going to be pretty different, I think, from ours. I know ours deals with like, a you know, a cable thing. Right. So so I think that's going to be a massive distinction um, here. So three specific functions. So the fact that they're giving us three specific functions and they break this down into three things means that I might um, I might want to have analyze each of these things and probably going to have to. So I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, there's actually a lot. So I thought issue one was really big, but issue two is also really big. There's, a, there's just a lot in here. This is a really race for CPT. So let's get into this. So there's going to be, we have to determine, are they an information content provider or an information service, whatever it is. Um, so we have to just think, we have to determine that. So one, roommates questions to, pro to prospective subscribers during the registration process, requiring them to disclose and therefore be subject to discri discrimination for their gender, family status, and sexual orientation. That's number one. So this is, I want to look, we are, because they're giving us these three specific functions, we are probably going to have to analyze those three specific functions for our client as well. So, and I want to know what they held. So, because roommate designed its website registration process around the questionnaire and choice of answers containing discriminatory categories, so they designed its website registration problem process around the questionnaire. 
And the questionnaire had them disclose certain things. So gender, family status, sexual orientation. So those are super private things. Um, and they designed the website around that, uh, the registration process around the questionnaire and the choice of answers, which contain discriminatory categories. So that's really problematic. Um, so roommate is the information content provider of the questions and can claim no immunity. So here, no immunity here. So let's add text. One thing is not always, but generally our client's going to be able to get what they want here. Obviously, like our client is Grace Gosling. She's going to really want to be immune from this stuff. Um, so I think she's probably going to be, we can, we are probably going to be able to distinguish from this, but not sure yet, but it's just something I'm thinking about. Roommates development and display of subscribers, discriminatory preferences. So development, development and display of discriminatory preferences. If an, if an individual queries for a roommate of a particular gender using a search engine that does not contribute to, but provides only neutral tools to carry out, to carry out what may be unlawful searches, the search engine has not engaged in development for purposes of Section 230. Oops. Why do I have to keep doing that? So here's another rule. But by requiring subscribers to provide, so let me just go to this. But by requiring subscribers to provide their preferences using a limited set of pre populated answers as a condition of accessing its service, roommate is more than a passive displayer of information created by others. It becomes, at least in part, a developer of that information. Discriminatory questions solicit and thereby develop discriminatory answers. Here, roommate designed a search to limit the listing available to subscribers based on gender, sexual orientation, and presence of children. Roommate both elicits the allegedly illegal content and makes use of it in conducting its business. Roommates work in developing the discriminatory questions, answers, and search mechanism, and in enforcing a system that subjects subscribers to allegedly discriminatory housing practices. And that I think is a little bit key, you know, is, is the fact that they're using all of this and they're subjecting subscribers to discriminatory housing practices because they're creating basically an entire system for people to discriminate against who they want to live with based on these protect, protected categories. So that renders it an information content provider and as such not eligible for immunity. So there's rule here, um, not immune. One thing I want to point out too, because there's these three bases that um, the functions so we want to analyze these three functions. If you look at how deep each function is, right? This first one is just a small paragraph. Second one is a really big paragraph. And they note one thing too. I'm going to show you like one thing that is here. You know, if an individual carries for a roommate of a particular gender used that does not contribute to provides only neutral tools. So they give you us this, they give us this very specific thing regarding gender. And even though in roommate there was gender, it was um uh, sexual orientation and presence of children, all three of those. But they say, they also say here that if it's just gender and it, there are neutral tools, then that's okay. You haven't engaged in development. And ours, you know, not surprising, just has gender. But there's a little bit of information missing. Um, so let's go to the next one. Three, roommates display display of discriminatory statements in the additional comment section of subscriber profile pages. So roommate encourages subscribers to personalize their profiles by writing additional comments about themselves and their desired roommate in a blank text box at the end of the registration process and publishes these comments without revision. It is not responsible in whole or in part for the development of this content. This is precisely the kind of situation for which Section 230 was designed to provide immunity. So here there is immunity. So the third function is this additional comments. Okay, and then they say one final note. We must keep in mind that the legislature enacted Section 230 to protect websites from liability for including or failing to remove actionable content. Close cases must be resolved in favor of immunity, lest websites be forced to face death by 10,000 cuts, fighting off a barrage of claims that they've created or developed actionable content. Such an interpretation is consistent with the intent of the legislature to preserve the free flowing nature of internet speech and commerce without unduly prejudicing the enforcement of other important laws. So here we have some policy. 
that we often want to incorporate really strong answers and incorporate the policy. Usually I use it in a counter argument, um, but I have all of these functions. So here I think, okay, rules for this are coming from roommate. I'm gonna have a rule proof from roommate. And here I'm gonna have an analysis for function one. Oops. Uh, analysis paragraph for function two, and analysis paragraph for function three. All right, let me just check in with you all, see how everybody's doing. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna start. So I have this whole setup here, right? And so I know exactly what I'm using. I know where I'm using it. I don't know about writing my analysis, but like this is why you know, here I'm making decisions. I'm gonna have a paragraph on this, a paragraph on this, a paragraph on this. And I wanna note here, like this second one is where there is the most discussion in that case. So that's probably my biggest issue. This is probably the biggest issue on the second part, third, second biggest issue and first biggest issue. Or sorry, first, second, third. You deal with it all in order, but like it's good to just be aware of your time and be like, I know I need to get through issue one really quickly or like this function one quickly, probably. Function two looks like it might be a little bit more difficult. Function three, you know, looks, you know, medium. So, although functions one and three sort of look basically the same. And three seems really straightforward to me because it's like they grant immunity and ours probably does the same thing. So, all right. Now I want to go back and start writing my rules and drafting my rule proofs, which like a little miracle. Guess what? It's already done. Oh, that's, let's get that. I did it live. So I would go back and I would type in my rules. A couple of quick notes on writing my rules. Um, oops, I forget to break this out. I did. I'll just scroll. So I put in my rules. After every single sentence, I have a site. And this is also Anderson. So just to show and just to show that I am using the right cases, I also think underlining stands out more than italicizing. So I underline instead of putting in parentheses or whatever, however you're used to doing it is fine. On the performance test, I don't use id just because if you change something around or move it, then it can be unclear. So I just, I never use it. I'm just in the habit of always writing. Um, I've just always like typing it out. I also think Sometimes people will like copy and paste, and I just think that that takes too long. I generally on the bar don't use copy and paste just to, like at all. Um, so I type in my rules from Anderson, and then I write my rule proof. So, and I do give you this formula, but I say what, and the, the key thing, and I, we, in the course, we will practice this a lot. I will give everybody an opportunity several times to write rule proofs. You send it to me in the chat as a DM. And I give everybody feedback, like in class, I just give verbal feedback. Yes, no, tweak this, do this. And then I will also provide, you will see what I wrote, but you will also see what other people in the class wrote. So you can have some good examples that way. All right. So I say what happened in Anderson. So in Anderson, that first case, what did the court hold with respect to this issue? The court held, um, uh, so the court held a reasonable trier fact with included internet user statements, communicated actual facts, and were therefore defamatory because the statement was labeled as facts, recited alleged specific facts detailing the plaintiff's awarding of city contracts to friends and family in exchange for bribes. So that's why. What did they hold? They said, yes, defamation. Why? I'd give the facts. And sometimes I'll give like additional reasoning. You know, I would say sometimes because they were labeled as facts, they recited alleged specific facts detailing bribes, you know, and the court cited to the policy of X. So some additional reasoning for coming to that conclusion. Conversely, in Inski, the court held a reasonable trier of fact with included internet user statement posted online, calling company executives liars, losers, and crooks express mere opinion um, rather than communicating actual fact and were therefore not defamatory because while the statement was unquestionably offensive and demeaning to the executives, the statement was more emotional catharsis than information and the court reasoned that, and the court reasoned, so here I'm adding some of that reasoning. Um, and let me just scroll down to 
yeah, it's all right in here. The court reasoned that internet porn promote a looser communication style uh, and an outlet for the user to criticize others. All right, so I put, I just copy in my rules and I explain what happened in the case. And this is, you know, one thing that I'm having conversations with people about. Um, and one thing I want to point out is like, do you get points for having the rules? Yes, like they, they do want you to have this stuff. They want you to explain the cases. The most important thing, however, by far is your analysis. You need to spend and have very thoroughly detailed, well-developed analysis with counter arguments. That is the most important thing by far. Um, and so if you are constantly someone that is running out of time, there are ways to kind of incorporate this stuff into your writing. I, my goal for everybody is always to show you how to do this and to show you how to do it within the time constraints. That is key. And do it within the time constraints so that you can spend the time writing, like really, really writing your analysis. I want you to have the most time on that. So that's really, really important. Um, and you can see just as like a little preview how much I spent discussing statement one and statement two. And when ours, after we read the file, I'm going to go through the file in a minute. Then we have. Um, so now I've, because now, so the, the point of this step, of, of step five, drafting the rule, you know, steps four and five, reading the library um, or skimming and reading it, and then drafting your rules and your rule proofs is after this, we're done with the library and we can just put it away and everything is on my page. And then I just have the file. So I'm done with the library. I'm not going to dig through these cases anymore. So now I go and I put in my rules for the second issue. So I'm talking about internet computer service providers. I put in all these rules. These are a lot of rules and I totally get that. There are ways to cut this down. Um, that is like a whole part of another class that, and those classes are three hours, whereas tonight's really like 90 minutes. Um, so yeah, so that is something that that is necessary. But for those of you, you know, that are just here, we're gonna watch this later. Um, I want you to know that like, you know, you don't always have to include every single rule. Sometimes, and honestly, quite frequently, rules are repeated. So you don't have to state the same rule twice, that's obvious, but um, it's kind of a skill to identify those things. So, and also it's just good to be fast at typing um, as well. So if, if you are not the fastest typer, um, and by not fast, I would say to do a typing test and determine your speed, and you should be at least like 30, 40 words a minute or faster than that, that's the ideal. So I go down to roommate, let's just at least go down to it. And I get, I put in all of these rules. There's a lot. There is a lot. So I have all of the rules in here, um, including the stuff at the end that was included a little bit later in the case. So, but one little thing I want to point out in a minute. So, and then I draft my rule proof. So I said in roommate, the court found the defendant one was an internet content provider. Um, and I want to add in because this your rule proof should always tie back to your heading. So I included some of this stuff, but I want to modify it here with you all. I want to know, were they immune, right? I, and like above in the first issue, I want to know, were they liable for defamation? Did they find the statements were defamatory? So here, uh, and it wasn't an internet content provider and not immune, not immune under section, what is it, 230? Yeah, 230. So because it designed its website registration process, I'm just copying this basically from here. Um, so why? So what did it hold? They, they were an internet content provider and they were not immune under Section 230 because, and I just pulled the facts from this little section, so no immunity. Okay. Um, two, it was an internet content provider because, and not, um, and not, immune under section 230 and why and i basically cop with, copy what they wrote in here um, because by requiring subscribers to provide answers for preferences using a limited set of pre-populated answers as a condition of using its service the website was more than a passive displayer etc 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 um and then three three the website was not an internet content provider and was thus an internet computer service provider, a little typo, um, and immune under section 
2.30 regarding its display of discriminatory statements in the additional comment section because it was not responsible, et cetera, what, you know, what they wrote. So I go in and I type in my rules and I craft my rule proofs. I will in class do this in front of you. This is something you can, and because I want us to do it together. Um, but I just want to, you know, walk you all through this tonight and show you, and then you can kind of pull this apart. Um, let me just pause and check in. All right. Now we're going to go on to the next step, which is to read the file. So we're going to read the file and figure out writing our analysis. Okay, and we're going to read this and I'm going to mark it up, take notes. It says, welcome to the voice of cable ratepayers in the city of Craven. I inaugurated this blog to highlight the incompetent and overpriced cable disservice. Ooh, she's snappy there, huh? And mistreatment we consumers receive as a result of the mismanagement and greed of the tone deaf colossus. They really like the word see here. Columbia Cable Company. Despite some government regulation, the lack of competition has nevertheless resulted in poor and costly cable service. It's time to educate ourselves about cable services, our rights as consumers, and ways to contain the cost of cable service. I will be posting information on these topics and invite you to participate by posting anything you think will contribute to these goals. My hope is that members of the community will subscribe to this blog and participate constructively in ongoing discussion and action. So great. All right. Note, to comment, you must be a subscriber. To subscribe, simply log on and use the pre-populated pull-down menu, insert your first and last names, full physical address and email address, gender, age, and whether you are a Columbia Cable Company customer. So here I notice that they have gender, right? But this is all dealing with um, uh, what is the cable services or disservices. Um, so this is about cable services, not for finding a roommate. So it's very different from that second case, from the roommate case. Um, all right. So there is gender here, though. There is also a blank box at the end where you can provide any additional information or comments. So this all, this sounds like, um, you know, in terms of thinking about issuing internet, uh, internet content or internet services, um, this is this information seems like it's going to be really relevant. And I might make a note about that about. Um, to write issue two here, um, that this is going to be helpful for that. So the profiles will allow you to choose which other subscribers to communicate with outside this blog, including to develop ideas and actions against Columbia Cable Company, organize carpools to inform events and the like. In solidarity, Grace Gosling. She has opposed rate increases. So here she's writing some information. On June 27th, 2022 at 6 p.m., the Craven City Council will hear a request from Columbia Cable Company for a 10% increase in cable rates to subsidize its planned recabling and the construction of a new store at the, St at the Stratford Mall. This comes at a time when we are experiencing further deterioration in customer service with even longer waits on the phone and at the stores uh, to talk to a customer service representative and bait and switch sales tactics. Be sure to show up all together at the meeting in the council chambers at Craven City Hall to express your opposition to the rate increase request and to demand better service and ethical sales practices. And if you have any other ideas about how to keep cable costs down, please post them below. In solidarity, Grace Gosling. Comments. Grace, and this is the issue. Thanks for starting this very necessary dialogue. I'll tell you a big way to keep down cable rates. Report cable theft. I live in the Green Hills condominium complex at 451 Green Hills Drive in Craven. Like most of us, I pay a lot for full cable service, while one of my neighbors, Jack Nisi, is guilty of cable theft. He uses various unauthorized devices to get free phone, uh, television and internet service to his condo. I'll bet he isn't even a cable subscriber. It's crooks like Jack Nisi who caused cable costs to go up for the rest of us. Hank Hardy, June 11, 2022. Hank, Hank, that sounds awful. Can you tell us more? Have you considered reporting these theft to Columbia Cable Company's cable theft hotline? So a couple things I want to point out first. So we have this first statement, right? This is our first statement. And I'm reading it and thinking, okay, well, how did this compare to that the statement in the first case in Anderson? Um, so one, he doesn't label this as facts, but I'm looking at this and it, this does seem like he's really, like he is asserting a fact. It doesn't sound like, oh, I think he's doing this, right? Uh, but he says Jack Nisi is guilty of cable theft. He uses various unauthorized devices to get free phone, television, and internet service to his condo. Here he says, I'll bet he isn't even a cable subscriber. But I was like, well, this is phone, television, and internet, but like, it's yeah, like I was thinking cable is more like TV, but um, so is it so 
this is is less affirmative, but these first two sentences are really kind of strongly affirmative. So I think it actually does sound kind of defamatory here. What a reasonable, um, you know, under the totality of the circumstances, is this reasonably, um, could it reasonably be interpreted as fact or opinion? Like in, in the totality, what is it going to be viewed as? So, and I think this one, it might be considered defamatory. And they say it's crooks like Jack Meese who cause cable costs to go up for the rest of us. In that second case, they, they mentioned using the word crooks. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, he uses that word, but it goes beyond that. There are these other statements that are very factual. Jack Meese is guilty of cable theft. He uses various unauthorized devices. So I think this sounds pretty bad and sounds like it is not just opinion, but it is probably more factual. Um, so then the next statement, Grace, this is, to, this is further to my June 11th, 2022 post about Jack Nisi. Since then, I've been watching him closely and get this while his wife is at work an attractive young woman is at their house. Most of the day, it looks as though they are watching TV on a stolen cable service. So it looks like they're watching TV. An attractive young woman is at their house. Most of the day. He appears to be a cheating spouse. So he says he appears to be. So that's less definitive, right? Versus the other one where it says he is. So I put a note on his wife's car windshield telling that nice woman about her husband's infidelity while she is hard at work. What a loser, a low life he is. I feel like I also am reading this. I'm like, oh, this sounds like a neighborhood I've lived in. People just need to mind their own business. But um, so these statements, I'm thinking about these two statements. The second one I definitely think is open is much more appears to be opinion. This first one I think is really problematic and this might be defamation, but, and this is really focusing on, and the case is focused on as a fact or opinion, but remember you do have to analyze all of it. And that was one of the biggest issues. Here's the complaint. Plaintiff Jack Nisi is a private individual who at all times mentioned in this complaint was a resident of Moorhead County, Columbia. Nisi has worked as an independent television producer for over 20 years, has resided at 451 Green Hills Drive in Craven, Columbia for about five years. I'm reading this stuff quickly. Uh, Nisi has, during all this time, been faithfully married to his wife, so he's saying that this is a false statement. Jill Nisi, and has enjoyed a good reputation, both generally and in his occupation. So he's enjoyed a good reputation, so this that is saying that that goes to whether or not he's had damage to his reputation. Defendant Grace Gosling is an individual and is now, and at all times mentioned as complaint, has been a resident of Moorhead County, Columbia. She is the web host of www.cravencableconsumersunited.com, which contains a blog. As such, she has unlawfully caused and is legally responsible for the injury to Nisi as alleged in this complaint. Defendant Hank Hardy is an individual. I'm not, I'm going to skip this because, but I just want to show you there, they are alleging all of the elements here. I won't read all of that. Then they go and they cite these two statements, so they're repeating the statements again. The statements quoted in paragraph five refer to Nisi by name and address and was so understood by those who read them. The statements quoted are false. So then this is really getting to the other elements. Among other things, Nisi has been a Columbia Cable Company customer for over 20 years. In that entire time, he has paid for every type of cable service he has ever received. He works with his technical assistant, Liana Mar Mabry. From his home office, his relationship with Mabry is and always has been purely professional. So statements quoted in paragraph five were seen and read by Nisi's neighbors, business associates, so published to a third party and seen causing damages as a proximate result. Um, he has suffered injury. So here he's uh, alleging damages and then you have the prayer for relief. So let me come back to you all for a second here. All right. So in this, we've seen a couple of things. We are able to really go through the file pretty quickly. At least I'm able to. And I'm reading it out loud. Um, so I think you all can probably go through it pretty quickly too. And things just sort of with the good understanding of the library, things sort of just jump out. Um, and that's the goal. It won't always be like that right away, but that is the goal. All right. So then the next thing that we would do, and if you have a question, you can, you can type it and I'll get back to it. Um, the next thing that we would, that we would do is we are going to start writing our analysis. So let me show you what that looks like. So I'm going to go back to my first issue here and you would want to think, you know, one, if when you're practicing, you want to see how much time you're taking Two, you want to focus and you want to have, you do want to have a solid amount of time. But we are always going to make comparisons. We're going to directly compare the facts of our case 
to the facts of the cases in the library. So I'm always going to start and I'm going to cite to the cases like this statement in Anderson, which alleged specific facts. Hardy's statement here also alleges with specificity because Hardy said Jack Nisi is guilty of cable theft and he using various unauthorized devices to get free phone, television, and internet services. The specificity, so now I'm explaining what is significant about that. The specificity contained in these statements come across as factual assertion and nothing suggests they are merely opinions. Why? Uh, because they don't express any doubt. I don't know. Although they are not labeled facts, as in Anderson, the affirmative way in which Hardy, um, in which Hardy writes, does not appear open to interpretation as anything other than fact. Although Hardy does refer to Nisi as a crook, which the court in Inski found to be an expression of opinion, and which suggests Hardy's statement is opinion rather than fact. Here's my counter argument. This argument is unpersuasive because the speaker in Inski was not calling people crooks in conjunction with a series of factual assertions like Hardy. All right, so I, I deal with that. So this is, um, so the fact that he does use that word crook, so maybe this is just, you know, um, emotional catharsis like in Inski. Um, so I say, go back. Well, Hardy's statement here echoes the statements in both Anderson and Inski because here, and this is really common, I think this one, it could kind of go either way, but I really think this statement is more defamatory. And if any of you struggled with this, I actually had a hard time, like, well, which way does it go? And it like, I sat for a minute and like thought through it. And which means you could really go either way. Um, while Hardy's statement here echoes the statements of both Anderson and Inski, a court considering the totality of the circumstances, I'm making sure that I'm addressing every component of the rule. So is it reasonable? Is it reasonably open to interpretation? I say, yeah, it, you know, it could be. And then, you know, if so, um, what is it? What is, you know, under the totality of the circumstances, what is it going to be found to be? So here I thought it would be more likely to be found to be factual. So while Hardy's statement here echoes the statements in both Anderson and Inski, a court considering the totality of the circumstances is more likely to find Nisi's statement is fact rather than opinion because, there shouldn't be a comma there, Hardy's comments here do not amount to mere criticism because Hardy asserts Nisi is to blame for the rise of costs on a website designed to critique the Columbia Cable Company. If a court were to find that statement were factual, um, there would also be publication to a third party because it was posted on 3cu.com. Additionally, Nisi alleges he has suffered injury in his complaint. Therefore, the, and I'm addressing that because you have to address all of defamation. Thus, Nisi can likely prove Hardy's statement regarding cable theft amounted to defamation because the statement is likely to be found fact and the other elements for defamation are satisfied. Or, or at least alleged. Statement two, unlike the statement, I think this one is very clearly not um, open to interpretation. I think this is very much, it's, it's very different. Unlike the statement in Anderson and like the statement in Inski, the statement regarding Nisi cheating on his wife is likely to be construed as opinion rather than fact because Hardy states that it appears as though Nisi is a cheating spouse rather than stating Nisi is actually a cheating spouse and offered and he offers evidence as to why he believes Nisi cheated, which lacks the specific factual assertion seen in Anderson and appears more like emotional catharsis for a man with a vendetta against Nisi. Um, given that this court is likely to find this statement opinion, these cannot prove hard, cannot prove Hardy's statement amounted to defamation, and then I have a conclusion overall. So I'm really walking through and comparing the facts of our case to the facts of the case, uh, the case uh, Anderson and the case within a case in Ski. So I'm comparing, saying how ours are different, and a lot of people. And one thing I've, I've seen in, in speaking with so many of of the bar takers is that. Um, People didn't break apart these statements and they didn't actually address all of the elements of defamation and that became problematic. So I broke down the statements and then also people spent a lot of time on issue one and not so much on issue two or vice versa. So then we have issue two, we have all the rules, we have that rule proof. And then, um, and then I go through each of the functions. So the designing the website registration process around the questionnaire with discriminatory questions doesn't use them to further discrimination. And then um, this is the additional comment section. So I won't go through it, you can read that. Um, so one other little thing here I wanna just mention is this is how you deal with the additional information. So based on the above, 
two pieces of additional information might be helpful. First, it would be helpful to ascertain whether the statements are in fact true. We can ascertain whether he's been a lifelong customer of CCC from CCC through discovery. I'm going to talk about the typos in a second. And could dispose his coworker to verify that he has not had an affair. Although Nisi claims these statements are false, it would be prudent to investigate these claims. Second, regarding the blog, it would be helpful to see whether the genu gender options were limited or contained the variety of gender options. We see um, a variety of gender options. I was thinking, I was like, is the bar trying to be like progressive or what? But I don't know. Um, I just thought about that. Um, and then I have my conclusion. Uh, oops. So this will be some soon. Okay. Let me stop screen sharing. All right, so um, all of that answer will be posted, that step by step, so you can see it. I could go deeper into this. There, I like even as I'm going through and was talking to you guys tonight, I said, "Oh, I could talk about this. I could also talk about this. I had so much more I could do." But I wanted to give you all a realistic answer, one that I wrote under timed conditions, um, which I did. The other part of it is one thing I talk about a lot is not editing your BT to make it perfect, not editing your response. All you're trying to do is make a good first draft. That's it, like a decent first draft that is readable, that answers the questions and gets like the substance right. You know, but that doesn't look perfect. You do not need it to look perfect. Mine, I have the, uh, mine has typos in it and it's fine, but they're not so distracting as to make it unreadable. I do notice them when I'm going through it, but all of you probably saw some, I will see them in here and it's not a big deal, you can see that. Um, one other thing I, um, Thank you all for coming. Thank you for sticking it out here with me. And um, this this will be posted to our website on our free workshops course. It should be posted to YouTube as well. And our um, our PT classes start uh, next week, so they start next Thursday. So I'll put a link there if you want to check it out. The class is four ninety nine, and you can split it up into payments. Um, I'll put the link for California in here to sign up. Does anybody have any questions? There is the um, there is the link if you want to go ahead and check that out. I also will be posting, if you guys get like our newsletter, I will be posting some tips I post on our blog. Um, I post to our blog and I'm going to be writing some tips. I'm also going to be recording some little things we'll post on social media as well. Um, so be on the lookout for that stuff too. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. And if you guys have a question that comes through after I sign off, um, I can still see those and those do get emailed to me so that I can make sure that we get a response. If you need anything, um, you can still type it in the chat here, but thanks everybody. Have a really lovely evening.